passage this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And I invite you to follow along in your Bible, or if you're using the Bible from the pew back in front of you, that, that passage begins on page 1700. Again, that's Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. back. Um, Pastor Steve is gone again, so I'm preaching for us again this morning. I'm so glad to have the privilege to, to preach to our congregation. I was sick this week, week, which was kind of unfortunate timing for Steve to be gone, but he was at a conference in Texas to uh, learn how to serve our church better, so it's been a, a good reason for him to be away. I have the privilege of continuing on in our series that we've been calling Our House, which is talking about four C's that characterize what it means for us to be the church. I introduce myself. My name is Alex. I'm our next di- director of Next Gen Ministries here at Payless Community Church. But anyways, this series has been four C's of what it means for us to be the body of Christ. Pastor Steve started us with the first C word, which was commission. What does it mean for us to be people who fulfill the great commission to make disciples? Our next C word was community. What does it mean for us to be a people who are united as one community? Our third one was commandment. What does it mean for us to live out Jesus' commandments to love God and love others? And this is our final week where we're turning to collaboration. This is our last C word. You might be a little bit skeptical, right? Like everybody hates group projects. Nobody likes group projects. Collaborating can be hard, and I know this full well. I used to run track and I played soccer at my high school, and I loved track Because if I won, it was because I ran fast, and if I lost, it was because I ran slow. But when I played soccer, our success or failure wasn't really dependent on me. It was dependent on myself and the 10 other guys around me, plus the 11 other guys on the other team. So our success and failure wasn't really up to how good I played. There were a lot of other variables that went into us playing, and it depended on how well we worked as a team if we would win or lose. I'm super competitive, so I didn't like losing because our team was terrible. The collaboration didn't really work for us at Chicago Christian. We were not a good soccer team. And as a church, we function more like a soccer team than we do as a superstar track athlete. I'm not saying that was me, but uh, we, we don't win and lose alone. We li- win and lose as a community who collaborates with different players and positions and teams and roles. We're more like a soccer team than a track athlete. And when we read through the Bible, we see that the church really thrives on collaboration. The church thrives when we work together. I'm not talking about us working with necessarily other peoples from other faith. I'm talking about when we come together as people of Christ, using the best of our gifts for the glory of God. The church thrives on collaboration. And today we find that in kind of an odd text. We turn to Acts 6, 
instead of something like Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12, which talk about how we're the parts of the body and, and we need a hand and we need a foot and we need an ear and we need an eye. Instead, today, we turn to Acts 6, which is kind of a, a sad story. We see a church of people that are complaining. We have a group of people that are just bringing their complaints up. And we see these widows who are defenseless in the society who are going hungry and starving because they're not being cared for by the church. This is the passage that we turn to to talk about collaboration. This early church community in Jerusalem, we, we can tend to idolize it a little bit. But when we look at it, we can see that every community has its challenges. First and foremost, every community has its challenges. Yet, we can empower one another to use our gifts. And finally, we see that everyone benefits when we use our gifts together. Let's read back through these seven verses, and we'll see those three things. One, every community's challenges. Two, is everybody's ability to be empowered to use their gifts. And three, we're going to see how everyone benefits. Let's reread those verses. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, you can pull your Bibles back up. It reads like this. It says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, let us choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the, to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into dissecting these seven verses. Lord Jesus, we come to you now asking that, that my words would be pleasing and acceptable to you and that they would be ones that land on the ears of this community and the hearts of our people here at Payless Community Church, that we would be open and receptive to what you have to tell us from this passage in your word. Lord Jesus, I pray that I would speak clearly and that our hearts would be open to hear how you have uh, guided our community through this passage. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty name. Amen. So first I said that I believe the church thrives on collaboration, but first we gotta really look back and see that every community has its challenges. And that's pretty clear in this passage. In verses one and two, we see the Jerusalem church is having this issue of a complaint that arose from Hellenistic Jews against Hebraic Jews. And to kind of understand what's happening here is we have two cultures of Jewish people. We have kind of two sects uh, involved in this Jerusalem church. We have the Hellenistic Jews who primarily spoke Greek, and they had been exiled from Israel throughout the entire uh, Greek and Roman Empire. And when they come back to Jerusalem, they kind of hold on to this Greek identity. On the other hand, we have the Hebraic Jews, and these are Jews who had been exiled to Babylon long ago, and they all come back together, and they hold on to their Jewish culture and identity. They stick firmly. They speak Aramaic. So we have a multicultural church, and our Hellenistic Jews, our, our Greek-speaking Jews, complain that their widows are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. In this society, widows, people who didn't have a husband anymore or seemed to not have any children, these people would be left vulnerable in a society where they couldn't defend or provide for themselves. So imagine we have this multicultural church and we have one group complaining against the other group because a bunch of widows are being neglected. This is, a, this is a challenging spot for the disciples to be put in. And, and mind you, these widows had nowhere else to turn. They had been shunned by their fellow Jews for becoming Christians. So they had no way of supporting themselves, and if the church wasn't going to do it, nobody was. This is the issue we have. And then there's a complaint that arises from our Hellenistic Jews that there's a disparity in support. It doesn't seem like this is an intentional neglect, right? Like the disciples wouldn't intentionally neglect widows. But the church is growing so fast that the leadership is having trouble keeping up. Right, it says that in verse one, that the disciples were increasing in Jerusalem. And people start complaining. This is not like a, a prayer request. This is not like a, a note in the offering basket or someone pulling aside a pastor and saying, really, I think you should do this. This is a full-on complaint. 
And in fact, the word that we have here for complaint is the same word that gets used about the Israelites traveling in the wilderness complaining to Moses. When they're like, oh, Moses, we're so hungry. And they become this angry mob and they start to revolt against Moses in the wilderness. This is the same issue that the 12 disciples are having. They're having a full-on complaint. They're at a critical point in the church where they're likely to have a schism if they don't resolve this. And to make matters worse, if we read back a couple chapters, we know that the disciples are preaching this bold gospel and that people are living incredibly selfless lives. They're like selling their entire houses and giving the money to the church. So we know the church is kind of flushed with cash, but still there's people that are going hungry. This is a tough spot for the disciples to be in. They're rightfully angry, and the disciples realize this. And they say something that comes off to me a little bit elitist. Here's what they say. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Comes off a little elitist to me, but I don't think the disciples are actually saying that this is something beneath them, right? We know the disciples are good at handing out food, right? They did it when Jesus fed the 5,000. They're kind of like used to this pass, the, the, the ability to pass out food. We know like Matthew, he was a tax collector. He's good at the logistics. They could do this work, but instead the issue is that to do all of this work of distributing food, they have to neglect their primary ministry, They have to neglect the teaching and preaching that Jesus called them to do. So what do they do? They've got this dilemma on their hands. Do they stop teaching and preaching and disobey Jesus? Or do they keep going as they're going and let people starve? It's a tight spot. They're between like a rock and a hard place. This early church, we tend to idolize it sometimes. We're like, they were living these radical lives. People were coming to Christ so often. But, But they're in a tough spot. Every community has its challenges. Right, when I was at, in college, I worked at the cafe on campus, and this was like kind of the, the prime job to have. Like every Moody Bible Institute student wanted to work at the cafe because we were like the cool kids. Not to like pat my own back. Anyways, everybody wanted to work at this cafe, and once I finally got hired, I realized that there were some issues at our, at our cafe. We were so busy working that we rarely had time to clean. So what do we do? Do we tell our customers, stop, I need to clean and build up this long line? Or do we just keep serving customers and we have this like filthy kitchen? What do we do? Between a rock and a hard place. So even this kind of like ideal job had its issues. What do we think about this church? At Payless Community Church, do we have our challenges? It's not really a rhetorical question. Like, yes, we certainly do. This community has its challenges. And I think we can take a moment to kind of name some of those things. What are some challenges that we have at PCC? What are some community issues that we have? I think one challenge that we have is is we have a group of people who have been here forever and ever and ever. We have a group of people who have just started coming in the past year or so, and we're having trouble bringing ourselves together in one united community, right? Like if you've been here for years and years and years, and you go down to coffee hour, it's easy to just keep talking to the friends that you've made through long years of relationships and harder to meet somebody new. If you're somebody new, we're so glad that you're here. It's also hard to like break into these communities of groups of people that have known each other forever. This is a challenge that our church has, is how do we bridge the gap? How do we bring these two sets of people together? Right, like, we should go down to coffee hour and meet new people. Don't, like, dash out the door on the way out of church. Like, the bears don't even play until noon today. Right, there's time to get to know one another and build deep community, because that's what Christ calls us to do. It's, It's a challenge that we're learning to navigate at PCC. I think another predominant issue that we have is, is that we are living in a community that's changing rapidly culturally and religiously and ethnically. And we're struggling to learn how to inter- interact with our Muslim neighbors. And this is one challenge of our community here. Our, our populace in our pews doesn't really reflect the culture that's around us. I think another issue or challenge that we have at this church is that we tend to expect the staff to do all of our leading and teaching and evangelism and discipleship. And I'm not complaining, like, it gives me a job and I love it. But if you serve once a month, that's a great thing and I'm so glad that you do it, but I'm guessing that God has gifted you in more particular ways than you're exploring in that one time a month. I know that God has gifted you in so many more ways that you could be using for his glory. And I would love to explore some of those ways. And I don't bring up these challenges at PCC to like, scare you off if you're new. I don't bring up these challenges to make you feel bad about yourself, but I want you to know that here at PCC, we're willing to be critical about our community because we want to grow healthier and healthier, and we want to grow to be more like Christ. At PCC, just like the disciples, we're committed to overcoming these challenges, and I want you to hear that. I'm not giving you a license to complain. I'm saying we're committed to overcoming our challenges. And that brings us to our second point. The disciples are not okay with this dilemma. They're put in this tough spot, and they are not okay 
sitting there without making changes. They don't want to let this issue of neglecting the needy persist. And this is our second point, that the disciples go about addressing this challenge in an unconventional way. Are you ready to have your mind blown? This is it. They form a committee. All the Presbyterians go crazy, like, a committee, we've never done that. No, I'm kind of joking. They, they do form a group of people, but they're not forming a committee. They're empowering and delegating to the gifted people in their congregation. This is our second point, that we can empower people to use and utilize their gift in our community. The disciples knew that the church would thrive when they collaborate. So they empower one another to use their gifts. Let's reread verses three through six and see how this plays out. These verses say, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The disciples' plan is to delegate. They delegate their authority to a few people who can be held accountable for distributing this food to everybody in the church. And they have a couple of qualifications for this job. They have to be people of good reputation. They have to be people who are full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. But that's about it. And so the people propose these seven men to the apostles. And here we have a group of people who are ready to meet their community's needs and face their community's challenges. And I think we see a few really cool things happening. And this probably could be a sermon of its own. So we're going to dwell here on these few verses for a little while. The first cool thing that we see is that all seven of these men have Greek names. What does that tell us? All seven of these men are Hellenistic Jews. The people who get chosen to meet the needs of their community are the people who are most deeply connected to this need. They're not Hebraic Jews like the disciples. One of them is even noted to be a convert to Judaism. That guy Nicholas, he's new to the whole concept of Judaism and Christianity and still he gets chosen to be a leader. This shows us that the taking responsibility in the church, it doesn't really depend on your background, especially culturally or ethnically. It depends on whether or not you fit those qualifications of being full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That's the first cool thing we see. People step up to meet their own needs. The second cool thing that we see is that the disciples pray and lay hands on these seven men. And that laying on of hands is still a tradition that we do to this day. We lay our hands on our elders and our deacons. And this is a symbol of spiritually ordaining someone to leadership. This reminds us that the task of even something as mundane as handing out food is still a spiritual task. Any sort of service that you do to the church is a spiritual task. This is something that is kind of unique to us. Even if you're you know, handing out food at coffee hour or if you're in the nursery holding a baby, that's still a spiritual task because it's service to God. Even if it's something mundane, even if it's something that just seems totally practical, this is service to God in a spiritual manner. And the last cool thing that we see is that these men are using their gifts. These men are using their gifts to meet the practical needs in their community, and we know that these men have other gifts. So we see kind of two things here. One, these men are meeting the practical needs of their community outside of their natural giftings. And two, these people are still using their natural giftings to impact their community. How do we know this? Well, Stephen, we see in the next chunk of verses, just down right after verse seven, he's doing miracles, like in the temple. He's literally like performing signs and wonders. And then the next chapter over, he gives the longest sermon in the Bible by anybody but Jesus. Stephen gets chosen to do this very specific, very particular, very hands-on task, but we know he's got other gifts, like preaching, evangelizing, doing miracles. And the same goes for this guy, Philip. Philip is referenced in chapter eight, for his ability to evangelize and interpret scripture. And still, he sets aside those gifts to meet the practical needs of his community. And also, he goes on to use his natural gifts too. Philip, in fact, like gets teleported by the Holy Spirit. It's a very weird scene that kind of happens in, in chapter eight, but we know he's so in touch with the Holy Spirit that he's using his gifts in service to the church and in service to his community. This is big for us because we can see that even if we're gifted in specific ways, we can work outside of those giftings and we can work through those giftings. God has gifted all of us in so many ways to be particularly talented at different things. He's given us spiritual gifts that we can use for his church. We can build our church up. It doesn't have to be the top few people doing all of the work like the, like the disciples. 
we can each be part of addressing the challenges of our community. It's up to us to step up to meet these needs. The Hellenistic Jews offered up a need, and they step up to meet it as well. Here at PCC, we have a process called confirmation for our students. And this is where students in high school or middle school get to express their faith as their own. And they go through this little red book with a mentor called Congrats, You're Gifted. And this is our way at PCC of empowering young people to figure out the specific ways that God has gifted them, the unique passions that he's given, the unique interests and skill sets that they have. And this book allows them to identify those things and figure out how they can serve God through his church in ways that we already offer or in unique ways. It gets our kids plugged into serving God. How could you get involved in collaborating with this church? How could you use your gifts or serve outside of your gifts to impact our community? If you're an elder, your job is not to be a committee person. So I'm talking to you elders right now. You don't have to raise your hands, but I'm trying to keep an eye out for our elders. Your job is not to be a committee member. Your job is to empower other people to serve God here. Your job is not to go to monthly meetings. Your job is to empower people here to use their gifts and to set a vision for this church. If you're not an elder, if you're just someone else sitting in these pews, maybe you don't even know what an elder is, that's totally okay. If you're a regular attender here, your job is to be raising concerns in our community and stepping up to address them. Your job is to recognize your gifts and explore ways to use them for the better, betterment of Christ's kingdom and the betterment of our community. Right? You're not off, off the hook. Your job is to step up like Stephen and these six other guys to help serve our church, to help serve our community, and ultimately to serve the Lord Jesus. If you're sitting in these pews, you're listening on the live stream, you're listening on YouTube, you have gifts. I know you do. God has blessed you in so many ways. And I would love to see you explore them and use them for God's glory here at PCC. PCC does not need a whole church full of me or Steve. That would be terrible. I wouldn't go to a church full of me. It's too many, <laughs> right? We need your gifts to fill in where I lack. We need to play to one another's strengths. Maybe God is calling you to use your specific gifts in natural ways. Maybe you should talk with an elder or me or a staff person about how your gifts could be used here at PCC. Maybe you don't know what your gifts are. Maybe you're like, oh, Alex, I'm pretty new to this whole thing. What are my gifts? I've got extra copies of this book, and I would be happy to sit down and talk with you or give you a copy to recognize what ways that God has gifted you with incredible skills that you can use for him. We can empower one another, so be ready. Be ready to use your gifts. It brings us to our last point. What happens when the church plays to their strength? It's pretty obvious in verse 7 that when we empower others to use their gifts, their community thrives. And this is what we're going to close with. In verse 7, we see that we, when we collaborate, everyone benefits. When we collaborate, everyone benefits. Verse 7 says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What's the result of empowering and collaboration? The text tells us that it's growth. It's new people coming to the faith. It's even Jewish priests coming to the faith in Jesus. This is crazy. In the last chapter, the Jewish priests were beating up the apostles for, for like spreading the gospel, and here they are coming to the faith because they see the way that their community is functioning and the way that the church is boldly proclaiming Christ. People respond in faith. What does the text not tell us, though? I think something interesting that we don't see is that we never hear a mention of widows being neglected in the church after this. The rest of Acts, there's no mention of that. The only time that we hear widows being mentioned in Jerusalem after this is when the apostle James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the church in Jerusalem, writes this. He says, true religion is to care for widows and orphans. James has it down. The church in Jerusalem, they figure it out. They solve their challenge and it never comes back to bite them again. And all of this is done through delegation and empowerment. What would it look like if we empowered one another to use all of our gifts for our community and for Jesus? What would that look like? Like, dream with me for a second. What would that look like? I can't even wrap my head around what it would be like if we used all of our best gifts for Christ's service. I don't even know. Let me tell you a story of a community in Tennessee, a church that did this, though. This church in Tennessee decided they want to play to their strengths, and they want to come together to forgive medical debt. This is what this church in Tennessee decided. We want to forgive people's medical debt. It took a whole lot of collaboration. The, the pastor had this original idea that, that if they buy the debt from debt collection agencies, they can just tear up a check and forgive all of that medical debt that's weighing on families in their communities. 
So it takes this pastor's original idea. Someone else had to figure out the legality of how do we do that? Is it like 501c3? Are we able to become like debt collectors or whatnot? Someone also has to figure out the logistics of this. Someone has to launch the fundraising campaign and then the entire church has to come together to donate to this cause. The whole church had to contribute and collaborate to this. And what's the result? What happened? This church was able to forgive over $8 million in medical debt. $8 million! They freed almost 4,000 families from medical debt and the burden that that had on their family. How crazy is that impact to see a church working together like that? Dream with me. What would it look like if we could do that here in Palos? What would it look like for us to come together and serve Jesus with the best of what we have to offer? As we close, I want you to, to take a minute with me to reflect on the ways that you're gifted. Reflect with me on the ways that God is calling you to serve his people here in Palos with your gifts. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, you have so abundantly blessed this people here in Palos. Lord, you have given to us far more than we deserve. Lord, through your spirit, we have been anointed with so many good things. Lord, you have given us abundant hospitality, wisdom. You've given us the ability to teach. You've been able to give us the the ability to have hope in a hopeless world and peace amongst people who are despairing. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would open our hearts and open our eyes, open our minds to be creative. Open our hearts to see the needs around us. Lord, empower us. Give us the strength to start to conquer those challenges through your spirit and with the help of those around us, Lord. God, I ask that that you would help our community to look inward. Allow us to, to recognize our challenges, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you would teach us to not be people who complain, but people who step up. Lord, I ask that you would use us and your kingdom to make an exponential impact here in our community, Lord. Father, we thank you for all that you've abundantly done for us. And we ask only in return that we might be a small part of what you do. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty name. Amen.